I have had the honor over the past several years to lead the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee. It is a committee that I truly feel represents the heart and soul of our country's values. And as I prepare to hand over the gavel now to my colleague, Senator Sanders, in the new Congress, I want to take a moment today to reflect on the incredible work we have done on our committee and recognize the many people who have made it all possible, especially my colleagues on the committee over the last eight years who worked time and time again across the aisle to solve tough problems together, from healthcare to education to supporting workers and retirees and working to ensure everyone can live with dignity and respect. The issues that we tackle are the issues families across our country face in their everyday lives. They are the issues I constantly hear about when I'm talking with people back home in Washington State. And during my time as the top Democrat on this committee, spanning three presidential administrations, we have had so much to talk about after all, a lot can happen in eight years, especially when you push every day to work with your colleagues and make progress for our families. We have made sweeping changes to help students and families, defended, de defended and expanded healthcare coverage, and worked to bring down drug costs. We updated and expanded worker training. We helped to expedite and expand our national efforts to bring cutting edge medicine to millions. We addressed the unfair practice of surprise medical bills and more, all before we worked to face the COVID pandemic. During our COVID response efforts, we were able to bring about the largest federal investment in childcare ever. We provided significant resources to get all kids safely back in the classroom and address students' academic and mental health needs, which the pandemic worsened. We made historic investments to ensure seniors and people with disabilities can get the care they need to live independently. And we saved the pensions of over a half a million workers and retirees and counting. But Mr. President, if I had to pick one moment that set the tone for my time leading this committee, I have to say it was right after the 2014 election when I was preparing to take over as ranking member and Senator Alexander was the incoming chair. As every colleague in this chamber knows, Senator Alexander was a true partner in always wanting to sit down and find solutions to problems. And for six years, we continued the long-standing help tradition of finding bipartisan solution to issues large and small. Early on, we sat down and found we were, both were hearing from schools and educators and parents who all agreed the No Child Left Behind law was not working. We had to do better. It was, a it was time to replace the No Child Left Behind Act. Now, Senator Alexander, my partner across the dais for six years, has said before he had initially been thinking of just moving forward on a partisan bill. Thank goodness that did not happen. He chose to work with me. Together, we followed his old 80-20 rule of finding the 80% where we could agree and working on that to help American families. And instead of staking out partisan positions, we staked out common ground with a bipartisan draft bill, which ultimately became the Every Student Succeeds Act. That was one of the first of many bipartisan breakthroughs HELP has made over the last eight years. But following that model, it was far from last. In fact, one year and three days after President Obama signed ESSA into law, he was signing another massive bipartisan HELP bill, the 21st Century Cures Act, a package of policies focused on advancing biomedical innovation for patients and families. Our bill also included sweeping mental health reforms championed by Senator Murphy and Cassidy. It focused on addressing the opioid crisis, and it created the Bo Biden Cancer Moonshot. 
We built on that work even further with our 2017 FDA user fee package. And even now, Senator Burr and I are strengthening that legacy in our end of the year package. Senator Alexander and I also worked with Senator Casey, Senator Enzi, and others to strengthen our workforce with a bipartisan reauthorization of the Perkins Career and Technical Education Act, which invests in students and workers by giving them the education skills and training they need so they can get better jobs and higher wages, and includes accountability measures to help improve prog programs and ensure that people aren't falling through the cracks. And working with Senators Hassan and Senator Cassidy, we passed the No Surprises Act to finally end surprise medical bills and establish new price transparency rules for hospitals. Our legislation has already stopped millions of people from getting hit with exorbitant bills for the care they thought was covered, including two million patients in Washington State. Senator Alexander and I also passed the Support for Patients and Communities Act to fight the opioid crisis and help those on the front lines of that effort. And it is painfully clear in light of the sharp rise in youth mental health crisis and the deadly new threat of fentanyl, there's more to do here. Which is why Senator Burr and I have been working around the clock this year on the bipartisan package of mental health and substance use disorder policies that are now included in the omnibus. And then of course, there was COVID-19. On the HELP Committee, we worked quickly to respond to the pandemic in the spring of 2020 with historic bipartisan relief bills and regular bipartisan briefings and oversight hearings to press the administration about the issues with our pandemic response. The many packages we put together addressed so many facets of our response, from getting shots into arms, getting kids safely back in school for in-person learning, getting our businesses open, and getting people back to their daily lives. And Senator Burr and I have continued to work to provide oversight of our COVID response and craft bipartisan legislation to make sure we fully learn the lessons of this pandemic. That has been a life passion for him. Even before the pandemic, Senator Burr was a leader on these issues. As a hearing witness once put it, he is the Papa of Papa. The bill, which is the foundation of our public health and pandemic preparedness system. And I could not have asked for a better partner across the aisle to work with me on strengthening that foundation these last two years. I will miss Senator Burr and his passion and desire to get things done. I join all of my colleagues in wishing him the best as he gets some well-earned grandparent time and being jealous of how fit much fishing he is gonna be fitting in over the next few years. Thanks to our joint focus, we were able to include most of our bipartisan Prevent Pandemics Act in this end of the year omnibus, along with an impressive suite of other bipartisan bills, like the FDA package I alluded to earlier, which among other steps includes policies to address the infant formula shortage to reform accelerated approvals and improve diversity in clinical trials. Our FDA package includes bipartisan cosmetics at reform as well. This is something we have been trying to do, get done since Senator Kennedy was chair of this committee. And I am so glad we are finally getting it across the finish line. The omnibus also includes bipartisan deals we negotiated to bolster families' financial security through greater access to retirement plans, better information about fees and lump sum pension buyouts, and new emergency savings accounts. And to respond to our nation's mental health and substance use disorder crisis, which the rise of fentanyl has made so much worse, Mr. President, this is so important. I have heard from so many heartbroken parents who lost a child to suicide or drug use. Too many first responders who are feeling overwhelmed by the sharp rise in overdoses. Too many kids who are struggling with depression and stress and anxiety. Getting them help has been a priority for me all year. And the package that Senator Burr and I negotiated includes valuable steps to strengthen the new 988 suicide hotline, make it easier for people to get substance use disorder treatment, 
helps tackle the opioid crisis head on and critical support for mental health care for our kids and more. And amid all this work on the HELP Committee, I've also been fortunate to have Senator Blunt ask my partner on the LHHS Appropriations Subcommittee. We worked on a parallel track in a bipartisan way to provide historic support for biomedical research, more than triple the size of our childcare programs, fund new CDC programs to look at issues like maternal mortality and gun violence, and make progress towards my goal of doubling Pell Grants and more. I am honored to have played a part in so much progress over the past few years. And of course, I could not have done it without willing partners down the dais and across the aisle. I didn't always agree with Senator Alexander or Senator Burr or Senator Blunt, but I always trusted them to hear me out, to understand families sent here to fight problems, not fight each other, and to make a sincere effort to find common ground. And speaking of common ground, Senator Burr had several lessons that he actually shared in his farewell speech last week, and I want to take a moment to heed one of those lessons now. Quote, thank your staff. They are actually the reason you are here. It isn't you. Well, I couldn't agree more. We couldn't hold a single hearing or confirm a single nominee or pass a single bill without them. Simply put, we couldn't do our jobs without the many staff members who are so dedicated to doing theirs. So I want to thank the nonpartisan committee staff led by the chief clerk, Chung Shek, who have supported both sides over the past eight years, helped us put together so many hearings, and allowed us to make unprecedented adaptations during the COVID pandemic. And I want to thank the staffs of Senator Alexander and Burr for their cooperation and collegiality in particular, David Cleary and Lindsay Seidman. And most of all, I want to thank the many, many members of my team, past and present, who have done so much. There are way too many to name. I'm just going to name a few. I will submit the full list for the record. Nick Bath, my health policy director for all eight years. Kara Marchion, my education policy director. Amanda Perez, my labor policy director. Kendra Isaacson, my pensions lead. Amanda Lowe, my disability lead. Carly Rush, my oversight lead and general counsel. Annalie Allegria, Al 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 sorry, Anna, my health communications director, and so many others, current and past. I want to thank them all. They have been precious to me, and I appreciate their friendship, their hard work, and all they do to help the American people. And of course, I want to thank our fearless leaders, my staff director, Evan Schatz, and deputy staff director, John Ryder, who have done a fantastic job steering my team over the past eight years. Thank you all. I am so grateful for all that you have done for me and what you have done for all the American people. It is clear that you understand we aren't just writing words on a page, we are writing policies that shape the lives of families across our country and the future of our nation. And that means so much to me because I know what it's like to be one of those families who's hanging by a thread. I know just how personal the HELP Committee's work can be, what it's like to try and get by on a tight budget. You see, my dad got sick with multiple sclerosis when I was young, and that meant he couldn't work. Thank goodness the VA helped cover his medical bills. So with my dad sick, my mother had to work while raising seven kids. And to make ends meet, she was able to take advantage of a federal work program so she could get a decent job as a bookkeeper. And my brothers and sisters and I were all able to afford college thanks to federal, federal grants and student loans. So I'm here because our government had our back. I also remember, in the days before Roe, a friend who was not able to safely get an abortion, and ultimately she lost her ability to have kids because the politicians put their ideology ahead of her health. And as a mom in tennis shoes, I got into politics to advocate for a preschool program that my kids were in that the state was threatening to cut. 
So this work of the HELP Committee is deeply personal to me. As a former preschool teacher, as a mother, as a grandmother, it has meant so much to me to have this opportunity to lead us forward on so many issues that motivated me to get involved in politics in the first place. And now I look forward to continuing that work in the new Congress, both as a member of the HELP Committee under Chair Sanders and Ranking Member Cassidy, and as the Chair of the Appropriations Committee, working alongside my friend, Senator Collins. I plan to tackle that new role with the same approach that has proven so effective over the past eight years leading the HELP Committee, because there's still much work to be done to ensure that healthcare is truly a right not a privilege, that every kid can get a high quality public education, that every parent can get childcare, that every worker has a living wage and a safe workplace and paid leave and a secure future, and that every woman can get abortion care and make their own healthcare decisions, and to tackle the harsh realities of unequal or downright unfair systems that have held too many families back. Mr. President, our nation is facing so many crises at this moment. The child care crisis, the mental health and substance use disorder crisis, the economic challenge of recovering from this pandemic, global challenges like supporting our allies and standing up for democracy. And Mr. President, we are not gonna solve them by fighting each other. Our best bet for meaningful progress next Congress is to work together and to listen to each other. So I'm going to continue listening to the people of Washington State, bringing their voices and their concerns here to Washington, D.C., and urging my colleagues to work with me to focus on making their lives a little easier. And I'm going to continue, I'm going to continue coming to work every day asking, how do we help the people that we all represent? How do we solve problems for everyone? And who is willing to work with me? Thank you, Mr. President. I yield the floor.